Okay, Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, and then 17 through 20, the Bible says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes or the wiles of the enemy or the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Then we'll jump down to verse 17 and read through verse 20. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, my, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And might I say, you all are praying for me, and I want you to know that words are being given to me, <laughs> and I am thankful for that. And uh, just keep praying for me, because I'm really, really grateful at what the Lord is uh, giving to me, what he's showing me, what he's revealing to me, what he has in store for us. Um, I'm looking forward to a, a, a series of messages that I'll, I think I'm going to start September the 1st. And um, I think it's a series of seven, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but uh, uh, it's good as far as I can tell. So I can't hardly read. I was talking, I, I don't know if you know this, but I, I, when I first got saved, they said, read your Bible. So I started reading my Bible. And I'm what you call an overachiever. I wasn't really, I wouldn't consider it healthy. But it's just the way I did things. If you read for an hour, I was going to read for two. If you read for two, I was going to read. That's just the way I was. And um, uh, I don't say that in a good thing. I think I did it because I found uh, I just I received approval when I did well. So I did everything that was. You do it for love. You know, you, you perform for love. That's not a good place to be, but I developed some good habits in spite of it. Okay? So anyway, uh, I decided, well, I want to read the Bible. Uh, they said read the Bible through one time a year, and I said, well, I'll read it through four. And so I would read it 13 chapters a day, every day, and for 20 more years I read uh, the Bible through four years, four times a year. You, you do the math. I'm sure I've read it over 100 times. And then I entered into a season where I can't hardly read a paragraph. And the Lord speaks to me. And because really the goal of reading the word, when, it's, when I first started reading, I connected with God, but I needed to have, um, I needed to have, what do you call, a vocabulary. And the word of God gave me a vocabulary, because I don't know if you know this, but the Holy Spirit draws from what you put inside. Now, he can give you stuff. I'm not saying he can't. But most often what he will do is he will pull from whatever you have stored inside. It's kind of like a computer. A computer pulls from the data that has input, right? Well, we're more than computers, but that's how the Lord works. So the more of the Word of God you have in you, the more he can pull out of you, right? So you, to learn the stories, uh, you don't have to have like every single thing memorized, but oh, I remember this story, I remember that story, you know? And here's what happens though, you read one time, you know, the Bible, and you forget there's so much information in the Bible. I don't, there's so much, you just don't grasp it all. So you read again, you read again, you read again. You're constantly reacquainting yourself, and then the Holy Spirit, when he starts working in you and through you, starts pulling from that, starts pulling from that, starts pulling from that. And so um, I got into this uh, uh, scenario where, um, I think I was trying to tell you, this season right now, uh, and what I was going to tell you was the goal of reading the Word of God, however, is more than just knowledge. The goal of reading the Word of God is to connect with the God of the Word. Right? And so don't feel... Uh, I struggled with it because I'm used to... I measured my spirituality in terms of how much I read. Now, I know you're not supposed to do that, but I did. We do a lot of things we're not supposed to do. Right? If, if you do everything right, raise your hand. You, you just did something wrong. <laughs> but, you know, so, so if, you, if you read a verse and you connect with God and that's all you, you've done, you've done more than you could ever hope for. You connected with him. You had, uh, uh, see, when you go out to coffee with somebody, right, 
The goal is not to drink a cup of coffee. What is the goal? To connect with them, right? So if your coffee's terrible, but you connect with them, it's a great time. But if you don't, if your coffee is great, but you don't connect with them, you miss the purpose of going to have a cup of coffee. And so you want to read your Bible with the idea that you're going to connect with God. You know, so I'm in a season right now where I, I, I'm reading a paragraph, but I'm connecting with him. And I've had to rearrange my ways of thinking, things that I've learned, uh, and, and some ways wine skins that I've developed. I'm having to, and, and I feel like the Lord helped me at that season of my life with that wine skin, but he's kind of like saying, hey, we need to get you a different wine skin, or we need to work on that wine skin that you have. We need to broaden how you look at things because we're working in a different season. And I, 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 I kind of uh, uh, liken it this way. You know, the universe, I love looking at the universe. I love these things where, you know, it takes this long to get from here to, to the moon and this long to take from, get to here to Mars and this long to get to here. Man, the solar system is so huge. It's so vast. And this as well, it takes this long to get from this solar system to the next solar system. Wow. And then it takes this long. And, it's, and then you could do the sun is this big. That's the biggest thing we know. And then there's, there are suns where you could literally put millions of our sons and so I mean, it's just like the, the vastness and so I love to look at the vast and then all of a sudden you find out you haven't even left the galaxy and there are trillions of galaxies that we can see because there's a universe that we can't see it's enough because the universe is expanding I mean it just blows my mind I love it but then you can go the other direction and you can look through a microscope and you can see a cell and then you can look through a, micro, the, a cell and you can see a part of a cell and you can go farther, farther. And the incredible world that's underneath a microscope that's invisible to our eyes, but it's visible to God is incredible. So you can glorify God in the macro and you can glorify God in the micro, right? God gets glory in all of that. And all I'm saying is sometimes you're in a macro season and sometimes you're in a micro season, but in all things rejoice. Right. I don't, uh, okay, so <laughs> I, never, I didn't even get on what we were going to talk about. Let's get back. So anyway, um, uh, Matthew 16 and 18, God says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the biblical worldview, we started this a, a couple of, uh, uh, maybe a month ago, is thoroughly supernatural. God's word gives us a biblical, godly worldview of how things really exist in the world that God created and how God intended the world and his creation to work. Scripture teaches us that there is a kingdom of God and of Satan, and the two are embroiled in open conflict. Now, it's not an equal battle. God created the devil, and God could wipe him out like that. It has, it's not an equal battle, but it is a battle. We are in conflict. Thankfully, God reveals to us through his word that, first of all, we are in a battle because you can go through your whole life and not realize you're in a battle and wondering why things don't work because you're in a battle. Two, that he has equipped us for the battle. And three, that in him, because at the cross of Calvary, he won a decisive victory over the enemy. He gives us the tools to live through the conflict that we're in victoriously. Can you say victoriously with me? Not just barely getting through at the skin of your teeth. Now, I know we do that from time to time, but the reality is we are victorious. We are overcomers. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, because they love not their lives unto the death. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. What is a more than conqueror? Well, a man, uh, of course, it's different today, but I'm a man, so I'll just use my perspective, okay? Uh, at one time, it was a man that would go out there and, and, and earn a paycheck and work 60 hours, 70 hours at Dow, do all that kind of stuff, make this incredible, conquered the work, the work, workplace, brought home a check. He's a conqueror. What happens? He comes home, gives it to his wife. She's more than a conqueror. <laughs> we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, right? So the first six items lift, listed in our text in Ephesians are essentially for protection or self-defense. We looked at those last week. And now we want to move from the defensive to the offensive. We want to deal with the weapon of attack that will enable us to assail and cast down Satan's strongholds. It is a fact of history and experience that no army ever won a war on the defensive. 
Someone asked a well-known general, in a war, which army wins? And the general replied, the one that advances. This is probably an oversimplification, but at least it is true that we will never win a war by retreating or even by merely holding our ground. As long as Satan keeps the church on the defensive, his kingdom will never be overthrown. Thus, we have an absolute obligation to move from a defensive position to an attack position. When Jesus first unveiled his plan for the church, he envisioned it, be, envisioned it being on the offensive and attacking Satan's strongholds. Now, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. I've read the Bible, and I don't see it that way. Now, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with perspectives. We're dealing with worldviews. We're dealing with a way of looking at things. If some, some uh, 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 professional football teams will hire a coach that their strength is defensive, and they will bring that perspective into everything that they do. It doesn't mean that they ignore the offense, but their strength is defensive. And then you have other coaches that their strength is offense, and they will come in and they will bring this perspective. But it's the same game. It just has to do with how you see it. And all we're doing is we're looking at the same scriptures, but we're just looking at it from a different perspective. The perspective maybe that many of us have had, I'm not saying anybody here or everyone here, I don't know, but I know I grew up on a defensive perspective. Just keep everybody safe and happy until Jesus comes back. We don't want to lose anybody. and We don't. We don't want to lose anybody, but the goal is just to keep them huddled and safe and make sure the enemy doesn't pick anybody off like vultures are flying around. And, and you know, if longer we huddle together, it's not gonna, he's not going to pick us off, but he wants to. That's kind of the perspective that I, whether it was valid or not, or whether I should have had that perspective, it's the perspective that I had. And I would tend to think that maybe others of us have had a similar perspective, okay? So what I'm trying to do is give you same Bible, but a different perspective. In Matthew 16 and 18, we read that already, but when, when we read it, we read it in a different version. This is the New Living Translation. It says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, he's talking about your name is Little Rock, my name is Big Rock. Upon this rock, Jesus is saying, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. An alternative reading is, all the gates of hell shall not be too strong for it. The Greek word for hell is the word Hades, and the root meaning uh, is invisible or unseen. So Hades or hell is the unseen world of Satan's kingdom. Jesus pictured his church in the light of two primary activities, building and battling. These go together. It's no good doing battle if we do not build. On the other hand, we cannot build if we do not battle. So we must think always in terms of building the church and battling the forces of Satan. Many have assumed that Jesus pictured the church being besieged in a city by Satan's forces. They have taken his promise to mean that Satan would not be able to batter the gate of that city down before Jesus came and caught the church away. That is a totally defensive concept of the church in the world, and in my opinion, it is completely incorrect. You know how people in concerts have been having stuff thrown at them here lately? I just, I'm getting ready. I'm dodging here just in case. In case I get a phone or a Bible thrown at me, all right? Jesus pictured the church on the offensive attacking the gates of Satan. He promised that Satan's gates will not hold out against the church and would not be able to keep the church out. It is not the church trying to keep Satan out. It is Satan failing to keep the church out. Jesus promised us that if we obey him as our commander-in-chief, we will be able to move out, storm the enemy's citadels, break through his gates, release the captives, and carry away the spoil. That is the church's assignment. And it's essentially offensive, not defensive. Get ready. Just get my Mike Tyson here. <laughs> the word gate has a great deal of meaning in Scripture. First of all, 
The city gate was the place where the ruling council of elders sat and ruled and administered the city. So when the word says that the gates of Satan will not prevail against the church, it means that Satan's councils will not prevail against the church, but will be frustrated and brought to naught. Second, in attacking a city, the natural place to attack is the gates because they are the natural point of entry and, well, let's say ingress and egress, and thus are naturally weaker than the walls. Once again, it is the church that is to be attacking the gates of the enemy and not the gates of the enemy attacking the church. We are to be on the offense and not the defense. So what I'm trying to get you is gates don't move. The gates of hell will not prevail. They're not going to keep us out. They're not going to keep us from doing what Jesus asked us to do. What that means is because gates don't move is means we're attacking his gates. Am I making sense to you? It's like picture Joshua and the Israelites going into the promised land and the first city they face is the most difficult city. It's the most a, a strengthened city. It's the biggest walls in the whole territory. They say that the, gate, the, the walls of Jericho were so massive that two chariots could run a, around the top of it all around the, the, uh, the, the whole city. Uh, it was encompassed by these walls. And that was the first place that the commander of the Lord of hosts, who will say Jesus, led them to. And he said, we're going to take this city down. No, we want to live in the wilderness. No, we want to go back to Egypt. No, that's not why I brought you out of Egypt. I delivered you from the enemy's clutches and brought you into the wilderness to teach you about myself so we could go and possess the land. And the land of Canaan is not heaven. There are no giants for the end. There are no enemies in heaven. So the land has to, uh, uh, it has to be a metaphor for the inheritance that God wants to give us. But in order to claim this inheritance, we got to be willing to go to, to battle. And so the first place they had to battle was Jericho, and Jericho had these walls, and in these walls there were gates. But who is attacking the gates? Now, that's a different story, and how we do it is supernatural and by following the plans of God. But the bottom line, it wasn't the enemy coming after the church or the people of God. It was the people of God on assignment following the Lord of hosts in partnership with heaven, attacking the city that the enemy has, was, was holding, trying to keep the people of God out. You see what I'm... Are you, are, you, are, you, are you tracking with me? Just make sure. Once again, it's the church that is to be attacking the gates of the enemy and not the gates of the enemy attacking the church. We are to be on the offensive, not the defensive. And the one offensive weapon that has been given to us is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Right? In Ephesians 6, 17 through 20, I'm the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. And by the way, how do we pray? If you want to be effective in your prayers, pray the Word of God. And you know that we're not, this is not a teaching on prayer, but you know prayer is more than just, oh, God, deliver me from these circumstances. That is part of prayer. We're not saying it's not. God, please intervene. That is part of prayer as well. Prayer as well. But also part of prayer is declaration. It is written. You say, well, that doesn't sound like prayer because we have to broaden our definition of what prayer is. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. It's, 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 it's taking uh, uh, Mark eleven twenty two. Uh, he says, uh, have God-like faith. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast to the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that what he says is shall come to pass. And then it says, uh, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive and it shall be done for you. So the context is prayer, but what are you doing in this prayer? You're speaking against the mountain. It's prayer, Right? 
Okay, so what I notice in this passage is there are several things that Paul mentions regarding the sword. All of them have to do with the mouth. What I mean to say, uh, what, what I mean is Paul says to pray. That is something that we do with our mouths. Paul asks that words would be given to him to declare the gospel boldly. That too is something that he does with his mouth. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So what we say, if what we speak, can have the power of God infused in it. Not everything that we say has the power. Some things we say uh, 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 empower the enemy. But I want what I say to empower the Lord. The best way I know how to do that is to speak. First of all, I'll speak very little. Some of you all are bowing your heads. But the Bible says, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Right? And when you do speak, try to speak biblical things. Whose report will you believe? Well, whose report are you speaking? Most of the time, what we believe is what we talk. Well, I believe the report of the Lord. Well, why do you keep talking about how big the enemy is? I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this like as if we did that. Nobody here does that. It's only those people that are watching on the internet. <laughs> What we must recognize is that God's work in this world is going to be accomplished through his authorized representatives, the church. 1 John 3 and 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. John 17 and 18, Jesus says, and he's praying to the Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them. Who is them? The church. Who is the church? Us, right? We, the church, have been given authority and power to do the work of God on this planet in his name. I've also made the case that God expects the church to go on the offensive. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty or have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And we're not talking about in other people. This is talking about uh, in our own lives. We, we have to take our, uh, Paul says, crucify the flesh. We've got to learn how to take captive the flesh, take captive thoughts and ideas that are not of God in ourselves and then also in the church. Right? There's too much of the world in the church. And you say, well, how can you say that? Because we all come from the world. That's why the Bible says, be not comfortable, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I came out of the world, and you came out of the world. And when you got saved, your, your spirit was renewed. But your mind was not. And you know, you can go all your life to church. Don't know however long we lives we have. And, and your spirit be ready to meet with the Lord, but your mind still think like the world because you never got renewed. I'm just saying, I'm not, again, nobody here, just people on the internet. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so the offensive weapon that we've been given to accomplish this work is the word of God or the sword of the spirit. My point is, is that our offensive armament is the word and the word of God that is spoken forth by God's people. That is our weapon. I believe there are at least four things that we can do with our mouths that we can categorize under the sword of the spirit. There might be more, but when I was writing, this is what came out. Okay. So the first of all is prayer. Ephesians six seventeen, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication making supplication for all the saints and also for me. So first of all, uh, prayer that is prescribed by the word, uh, Luke 11, 2 through 4. So he said to them, when you pray, say. So in other words, the Lord is 
he has certain ways that he wants to teach us how to pray. He taught the disciples in Matthew 6, verse 9, which is what we're referencing here, but just out of Luke. When you pray, say this, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, we probably most of us, I learned how to say that prayer, and I prayed that prayer, not realizing that it's like seed. It's like seed. So in other words, learn the prayer, but then let the seed of every thought in that prayer grow. Let me say this. It's like a model. It's like an outline. And the Holy Spirit will fill in the outline as we go along. Right? But the outline is, Our Father, you give glory to God. Hallowed be thy name. Everything that you do, you receive glory. How do we... How do we receive glory? First of all, we've got to define the nature of God, not the enemy. Do not let the enemy define the nature of God. Let God define his nature. The Word of God says that he is good. So anytime we go through incongruities, we always have to have as a foundation that God is good. Because the enemy is going to come along and say, this wouldn't happen to you if God was good. Well, I know that's not true because I know what the Word says, the Lord is good. And his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all our generations. And the Bible says that the enemy is a liar. God good, enemy bad. Right? Foundation of reasoning. Don't let the enemy confuse you. So we have to know what the word of God and we have to pray according to the word of God. I pray, that's the second point. Pray according to the word. John 14 and 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. In his name means in agreement with him. He is the word. And when you pray in agreement with the word, the word was given. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All, uh, all the words of God. I mean, uh, his, his uh, what's the... Your words are forever written in the heavens, is what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only forgotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So prayer for the word. Okay, so prescribed by the word, prayer according to the word, and prayer for the word. That's what Paul was asking for, that it might, be, that it might go forth and be effective. In Colossians 4 and 3, at the same time, Paul says, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So first thing we looked at, weapons of our, uh, one of the ways we can use the sword of the Spirit as a weapon is through prayer. The second way we can do it is through praise. 2 Corinthians 20, 20 through 22, And they rose early in the morning, went out in the wilderness of Tekoa, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. By the way, do you know that that is a song? They weren't just making that up. That came from the Psalms. So how were they praising the Lord? They were using the Word of God to praise the Lord. They were singing the Psalms, and they were singing it in an offensive mode. The Lord promised that they wouldn't have to do anything, but they still had to march out to battle. Now, many times we do have to do things. But in this particular scenario, they didn't have to from the standpoint of they weren't going to have to fight, but they still had to do something. Just like Joshua and them, they didn't have to go in and tear down the walls, but they still had to do what God said by going around the walls. And so the, 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 the way that they use uh, uh, the Word of God in this particular situation is through praise. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent an ambush against the, Mo the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and so they were routed. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord when things are going good. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord most times. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. As I said before, the word rejoice always is, already, is already doubling something. Re means to do again. So you're already doing it twice there, and then it asks you to do it twice again. 
rejoice, and again I say, rejoice. Well, man, I just got hit by something. I'm down. I don't feel good, right? So what do we do? We talk about a problem. And then many comes in, like we talked about before, and tells you why God's not good and why this happened. And if God loved you, why didn't he do this, right? But the Bible says one of the weapons of our warfare, the weapon of our warfare is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so what can we do? We're in that position. What can we learn? How can I go on the offense? Lord, I praise you. For you are good. Your mercy is everlasting and your truth endures for all generations. You are awesome, God. I don't care what I see with my eyes. I don't care what I'm experiencing. I know the truth. And what you're doing is you're going on the offensive. Because sometimes you feel helpless. I know that. Right? And sometimes in the overall scheme of things, we feel like, um, we feel like we're out of control. And sometimes it's just a little thing that we can do as long as, you know, like with sometimes, I'll just be personal, with my back, sometimes I feel like I don't have any control over it. I feel powerless. I don't like feeling powerless. Do you like feeling powerless? I don't. And so if I can have something to do, a measure of hope, a glimmer of light, then at least I begin to feel like I'm not completely powerless. I have something that I can do, Right? Now, I can't heal my, my back, but if my chiropractor says, do this, or, you know, when we do this, things go better, I feel good, and I find I, in the morning I do what he tells me to do, and I'm pretty good about doing it because I, I want to have good health. But in the overall scheme of things, you know, it's the Lord that heals, and so what I can do is I can praise the Lord, and I can declare the promises of God in prayer, in praise, and I thank you, God, because you're good. I thank you because your word says that you forgive all my iniquities, you heal all my diseases when I'm feeling down, and listen, I'm not perfect, and I'm not saying I always do this, but I'm growing in God. And as I'm growing in God, I'm learning how to do this. I'm learning how to go on the offensive. I'm learning how to not not live powerlessly, but to go into battle with weapons that I do have. And the weapons that I'm telling you, the weapons that we have are the Word of God. And one of the two ways that we've seen that we can do that so far is through prayer and through praise. Right? So Jehoshaphat's people were delivered in praise as they sang the Word of God. Third thing we can do is we can profess. Matthew 4, 1 through 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. How come the enemy always comes with a banquet when you're hungry? Whatever the temptation is, right? When the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus answered and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not precedes, but proceeds. Comes out of the mouth of God. And how does God speak in this world today? How does God speak in the world today? Through us. Right? Good answer. <laughs> By the way, scripture, the scripture Jesus uses against the attack of the enemy is one that reiterates the importance of declaring the word. Jesus said we live by the proceeding word. He fought the enemy with the proceeding word. He didn't think the word. He, the enemy didn't back off when Jesus was thinking the word. When did the enemy back off? When he spoke the word. It's good to think the word. But the power, and now, uh, I haven't done a full study on it, but I'm, I think I'm on good ground if I say the power is found when we profess the word, when we speak the word, when we say what God is saying. Whatever, whatever you bound on earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. You look at heaven, you look at the word of God, the Bible says this is what God has done. And so instead of talking about what the enemy's doing, again, I am on that, you say, this is the word. Yes. 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 Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is living, active, sharper than any 
two-edged sword. Two-edged sword is good, but the Word of God is better. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Listen, a natural sword can pierce your flesh, but the Word of God can, can pierce even deeper than that. Mark 11, 22 through 24, Jesus answered them, Have faith in God, or have God-like faith. I like that better. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. You believe that you receive it, but in believing, you begin to declare what God has said. You've got to speak it forth. You've got to speak. I've got another message that, that I'm, I think I'm going to teach on Sunday. Is that the one I wrote about Moses, right? Yeah, I think I'm teaching on Sunday. And uh, I'll give you a little preview. Uh, God said to Moses, uh, go declare my promise to the people and declare my promise to the problem. Who was the problem? Pharaoh. And he had to declare it again and again. And again, but man, I just preached my message. Oh, you're not coming on Sunday anymore. Oh, you got to speak publicly, and you got to speak the promise to yourself and to the people around you, and you've got to speak to the problem. Right? So you don't ignore the problem. See, a lot of us think faith is ignoring the problem. A lot of us think faith is denying the problem. That's not faith. Faith is recognized because you can't, you, can't you can't look at a problem. I mean, you can't speak to a problem that you're not willing to face, that you're not willing to see. So you look at the problem, and you see the problem, but you see the God who's bigger than the problem. And you begin to say what the problem solver says, not what the problem is saying. Right? Listen, I'm teaching myself and you how to fight. Everybody that goes into the army, into the military, I, I'm not in the army, the military, I think some of you have been. <laughs> I'm teaching you, they all get, they all go through boot camp and they all learn how to fight, they all learn how to use the weapons, they all, but it doesn't mean that they will all fight. Right? It doesn't mean they all do it well either. There is a measure of, I see the importance of doing this, and I need to get better at this, and I need to recognize that I'm in an army, and, my, and what, I don't care what my recruiter promised me. I'm going to go to Hawaii. I'm going to go to Japan. This is what he promised me. What he didn't emphasize was that you are a fighting machine. Well, I wanted to go to Japan, but I ended up in Afghanistan. That's right. Because you are in the military. And you've been recruited not to go on a vacation. You've been recruited to fight. And once you get that in your head, the better you get at it, the better you'll do. Once we get into our head that we are the army of God and we're in a battle, but God has equipped us for this battle to fight, once we get past that hurdle, then we need to learn, how do I use the weapon that God has given to me? How do I go on the offensive? I'm tired of hiding from the enemy. How can I take this battle to him? Doesn't mean that everybody will fight because in a real uh, war, some people, they, they check out. They go AWOL. They hide. They, they, uh, they, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they turn themselves into the other side. They what? Defect. They defect. Right? We don't want you to do that. I, I want you to know that in Christ, we win. Amen. Amen. No matter what, we win. We already won. We're just enforcing a victory. So anyway, last way, I'm sorry, it took a little longer, but I'll finish here, is we have to proclaim. Now you said profess. Yeah, we're professing the word, but now we're talking about proclaiming the word. We're talking about what I do, what you do when we talk to people that are lost. 
right? Ephesians 6, 19, as for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So we need to proclaim the gospel for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In the word of God, in the gospel of God, in the good news of Jesus Christ, it's not just a good message, it is power. And we have, to, we have to let God use us to proclaim that gospel that will bring the power of God to change somebody's life. Romans 10, 14, and 15. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have not heard, never heard? And how are they here to, without someone preaching? But don't get hung up on that word preaching. It could be someone that tells them. Because we have this idea that the only one that preaches is the one that's hired by the church to do it. No, we're all called to tell people about Jesus. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Well, I'm not sent. I'm saved. No. Uh, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? Make disciples of all nations. All of us have been called to go. So you proclaim the gospel, but number two, you proclaim your testimony. Tell people your testimony of what God did for you. Revelations 12, 11, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You are the word of God made flesh. You, your testimony is what God, is God's word become manifest in your life. When you testify, you are giving glory to God, but you are also going on the offensive. The devil's been wessing with me. How, how can I? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to do this. What's another way I can do it? I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm going to tell them my testimony. I may not know the scriptures, but I know what God did for me. Amen. Revelations 19 and 10. I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So in conclusion today, we studied the weapon that enables us to assault and cast down Satan's strongholds. It is a fact of history that no army ever won a war on the defensive. Thus, we have an absolute obligation to move from a defensive position to an attack position. We looked at four means to use our primary weapon of attack, which is the sword of the Spirit or the Word of God against the enemy. These are prayer, praise, profession, and proclamation. Amen? You know why they kept Paul, locking Paul up in jail? Trying to keep him from proclaiming the word. <laughs> I need to stick to the script. <laughs> Every time I get off script, I get in trouble. So I need to stick to the script. I was thinking about, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> I was thinking about the agenda that the spirit of this world, the spirit of the age, had whenever it tried to mask us up and keep us away from one another and not talk to one another. Silence anything that doesn't follow the script. Jesus is bigger than COVID. Jesus is essential. Jesus touched the leper. He didn't back away from the leper. What I'm saying is that the world wants to silence us. And when we become silent, we are defensive. The only way we can go on the offense, we're not in, we're not in a war with the world. The weapons of, uh, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the powers, the principalities, the rulers, what they're trying to do through intimidation, manipulation, domination, deception, is they're trying to silence the church. 
you say anything that doesn't match up to the approved narrative, you get cut off Facebook. You get, uh, uh, you get unfollowed and voted off, uh, I mean, uh, uh, YouTube, get unfollowed and voted off Facebook. You're not allowed a platform, right? And it's, 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 if we're not careful and we don't go on the offensive, I promise you they're not going to be happy with just us not saying anything. At some point, people that are standing up for righteousness by going to the schools and saying this is, from, this is basically demonic, what you're teaching our kids is not, hey, you know, fair and equality. No, what you're teaching our kids is from the pit of hell. And we don't want it, and we don't want our kids teaching of it, so what do they do? They label them domestic terrorists. He said, you know, we don't have a right as parents to tell the school what we want our kids taught. Well, uh, uh, I don't want to do... See, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, because they did not fear their lives, the loss of their lives, even unto death. Fear keeps us silent. We need to stop being silent. Our offensive weapon, and God wants us to be on the offense, is to speak. Listen, speak wisely. Speak with a heart of love, but speak the Word of God. Don't apologize for speaking the Word of God. We don't have to apologize for believing there are two genders. The Bible teaches that. He created us male and female. In fact, I'm not even going to give you my opinion. I just gave you the word of God. He created us male and female. Well, people have different inclinations. Whether you have a different inclination or not doesn't mean that the word of God is now pro your inclination. People also have inclinations to steal. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. We don't have any problem with that. We, don't, we say, well, everybody should be able to do whatever they want as long as they don't do it to me. Well, guess what? Somebody that steals somewhere down the road, they're going to steal from you. And then all of a sudden, you're going to say, that ain't right. Well, you've got to realize is that what you created, uh, 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 what's happening is what you created. What's happening in these cities is this woke agenda has created a monster. We need to get back to the Word of God. And we need to stop being uh, uh, apologetic about believing in what God says, about believing in the power of God, about declaring the Word of God. Again, we don't need to be self-righteous. We don't need to be judgmental. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to put anybody down. We don't need to condemn. All we need to do is say, it is written. This is what the Word of God teaches and I'm standing on the Word of God. Well, if you don't do what we say, we're going to throw you in a fire. God can deliver me.